today, our, our host sponsor is SNME. And, um, you know, I'd like to thank them for, for, um, for their continued partnership. Um, SNME was formed in 1973, initially providing geotechnical and construction material engineering services to clients. Within a decade, SNME grew to a company of 500 employees and 15 offices across six southeastern states. As the company expanded, they added several environmental services and in turn increased our staff of experts. Today, SNME is a thriving company with vast technical expertise in 34 offices in 11 states. SNME provides civil engineering, construction services, environmental geotech, planning, and design. So thank you so much. So Emily is a associate professor in the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture at Auburn University. Emily earned her Master's of Architecture degree from the University of Oregon. Her undergraduate, the Bachelor of Architecture degree is from Auburn, and she's a registered architect in Virginia. Dedicated to supporting architectural practice through design education excellence, Emily proudly teaches third-year students um, a third-year studio at the Roll Studio in, in New Bern, Alabama. Since 2017, she served as a third-year level studio professor and a job site superintendent. Recently, she was awarded the 2019 Outstanding Faculty Teaching Award from the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture at Auburn University and credits this award to the hardworking students she teaches each semester. Building and teaching at Rural Studio helps her to intimately understand and therefore critique contemporary building enclosures and systems. To date, Emily and her students have built two homes for local community members, and a third is presently under construction. Students propose alternative assembly details and test them each academic year. Feedback on cost, construction, materials, and performance helps advance Rural Studios' 20,000 home, home initiative long-term goal of developing a single-family affordable home for use by other housing nonprofits across the country. This feedback loop of research through design and build and back again is central to her research agenda and teaching pedagogy. Emily, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really happy that you're here. Um, we're gonna switch over so that you can, um, you can get into your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Diana. Let me share my screen. I mean, you guys can see it. Let me go to full view. How does that look to everyone? Does it look okay, Diana? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. great. All right, well, I'm really happy to be here. Um, thank you, Diana, Dale, Adam, and the whole AIA East Tennessee crew. Um, we've been planning this for over, before the pandemic. So I was meant to be there in person. So we've really, a lot of things have changed in a year, haven't they? I know it's been like that for everybody. Um, so, but I'm, I'm happy to be here broadcasting right from Alabama for this uh, presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Rural Studio, not only about, I'm gonna talk um, about a few things. I'll, I'll give you a short introduction about the program itself. You, most of you have probably heard of it before, so I won't get into our history too much. I'll talk mostly about the community projects um, that we've been working on for the past 27 years. And then in the end, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a review of what my, um, my studio has been doing in the third year, working with the 20K a house initiative and the front porch initiative um, to to like Diana said develop a um, an affordable housing model um, and put some of our research into action in um, in other places across the country. So uh, you probably uh, we are Auburn. The Rural Studio is an undergraduate. It's mostly undergraduate students, but it's a it's an outreach campus of the architecture school at Auburn University and. Our students, you know, the the I always like to start this presentation to tell everyone that our and we we do a lot of things, but our main intention, our main goal is to teach architecture students how to build better buildings, um, and that's our that's our top priority. There are, as you'll see, a lot of other benefit benefits to working in our community, but that's our top priority. So the students move to Rural Studio, move out to Hale County. To, um, to put things into action and to build the things that they design. Um, sometimes people are curious about how it works and where it works in the curriculum. So this is just a, a sketch. We are a five-year 
bachelor's of architecture degree um, program and uh, students have two opportunities to move out to rural studio to be a student there the first opportunity they have is in their third year of study which is um, the the group that i coordinate and that's also kind of the study abroad year so students have the option to go to rome and istanbul or they have options to go all over the world and so you can kind of think of rural studio as a study abroad option for some students and then they have another opportunity in the fifth year to come out um in the third year i get two groups i get a group in the fall and i get a new group in the spring and we generally build one year one house in that year and then in the fifth year uh, we have up to sometimes 16 students come and they break into groups of four and they do larger community projects and they're there for the entire year for the entire academic year and sometimes a little bit over that academic year Rural Studio was started almost 27 years ago by a man named Samuel Mockby. He is a Mississippian. He's no longer, he passed away in 2001. And Andrew Freer, who's the director now, has been the director since uh, his passing. And uh, things have uh, evolved, which is how we want them to be. We've, we've kind of had two stages of uh, Rural Studio. You might be familiar with some of the original projects, which I'll show you. but. My main intent is to show you the, the new stuff that we've been doing. I think the other thing you should know is that we're fiercely place-based, which means that um, we are in West Alabama. So here's a, uh, duh, a map of Alabama and Auburn's on the east side. So that's main campus. And when our students move over to work with us, you know, they move two and a half hours away from um, campus there's fewer distractions and also it's it's kind of a um a show of commitment also there's really not much else to do except go to school when you live in newburn or in greensboro um newburn is our home base and that's where my students move um and then most of the uh older students they they live in greensboro so this is uh this is our downtown that red kind of rusty building we call it the red barn that's my studio space and we're also um, and it looks quite a bit like uh, other studio spaces that all of you you know probably worked in as students and uh, the but our one of our benefits is that we get prior to the pandemic we get lots of guests and to do reviews so that's glenn market there on our we had a 20-year celebration that he came and we're just bragging a little bit that glenn market came to visit us so our, my students move and live on campus in what we call the pods and uh, this is this shot is a pretty old picture they, they don't look as um, fresh as they do now but we're adding new we these are kind of, these are experiments kind of architectural experiments and we test things on our students first before we test the community so we just built a new mass timber pod that students will be living in um, next year so um, I said that we were fiercely place-based, and what I mean by that is um, we are proud guests of the West Alabama community. We um, we aren't there to to um, we we although it does look like Mr. Potato Head is taking over downtown. We aren't there to uh, to tell folks how they should live by any means. But we our goal is to become part of the community and to make the spaces for folks who are from there to have important conversations. And I hope that I'll be able to explain that to you. So we're part of, um, we, we are guests in the West Alabama community, but we also work really hard to create our own community. So we have a big Halloween review each year and um, the students feel very, you know, tied to, and um, there's a sense of community amongst the rural studio faculty, staff, and um, students as well. We have a post office and a little mercantile downtown, which are the kind of the lifeblood of our community. Um, and as you all know, if you're from a small town, post office is really important to maintain. We only have about 300 people in our town. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of uh, assets to our, to working in our community. And I think the greatest one is our history. West Alabama and a lot of Southern places, I'm sure you know, are known for their antebellum mansions and um, the kind of a pre-war architecture. Kind of, we have we have that tourism in our 
are in our neighborhood. And we used to uh, talk about that a lot in this presentation, but um, I think what's more important is the, the other familiar places of a more recent past um, in our area. So in the, the, the cities listed in our map here, besides New Bern and um, Auburn and Greensboro, we have Selma, Montgomery, and Birmingham, which are three very important places to the um, civil rights movement. And so um, not only do we try to learn from the, the technology of the houses prior to air conditioning and looking at um, uh, and, and learning from the buildings in our region, we're also trying to learn from um, and how to become better citizens through the past that exists. So the first project I wanna show you is the Safe House Museum. This is a, a student-led project, four thesis students built it. And um, it is a, it's, a, it's just two, it's not just two, but originally it is two shotgun homes. And the one on the right that you're looking at was a, is a building that Martin Luther King sheltered in one night. And it's an important part of the Depot Street community in downtown Greensboro. Ter Teresa Burroughs was our client and um, she worked with us to uh, preserve the original space, but then also renovate it and then add a gallery space that's also a new community. So this is a museum that's open to the public where you can learn about the local um, history of the civil rights movement in, um, in Greensboro and in our area. So the two buildings are connected through this passageway, this breezeway, and it's pretty powerful to see these images and walk uh, belong, walk it's haunting also to see that space lit up from the street in the evening. A lot of the, in, the interior was preserved just um, because of course it's beautiful as you can see. Um, but it also it describes and um, presents the you know the the essence of the space as it was years ago. When, Tour groups come here to learn about um, our past. And then there's also a glimpse of the future here too. We have a gallery and they organize artists to come through and, and meetings can happen here as well. So I think that this is a good example of what I mean by a community project where um, we, uh, we, we are learning from the, we're learning from the community and providing them spaces to help um, the conversations that they want to have. So, you know, when we begin to recognize our past, you have to understand that the past injustices have left their mark on our area. Um, and part of it is a lack of opportunity. Um, if this, the entire United States, if the poverty level is about 14 and a half percent, Alabama is a little bit higher at 18 percent. And then Hale County, which is our home base, is at 27 point, about, you know, 28 percent. So images like this or scenes like this are not unfamiliar. And, um, you know, truthfully, they're becoming um, less and less familiar. They're being replaced by the house trailer. But that's kind of another whole lecture that I'll give. But so Rural Studio, my point being is that um, housing conditions are poor for a lot of the, our community members. And Rural Studio started with housing. So if you're familiar with the work that we've done, you might have seen the Haybell House. This is the Bryant household. This was the first Rural Studio project that we ever built. And these projects are beautiful, I'll, uh, I believe. And they were built out of experimental materials and sometimes out of materials that had no value until we gave them um, value. So like the, the smokehouse that's in the background is made out of old sidewalk pieces that were collected from um, Greensboro. And, uh, but there, these are, these are, this is architecture that is, is a beautiful space, but not necessarily affordable or even, or replicable. So, um, we've moved, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this at the end of the presentation, we've moved away from making uh, individualized um, houses like this to, to building, um, uh, we're studying and researching affordable, replicable uh, 
uh, solutions for housing affordability at the rural studio. Um, and that's that's basically the, the summary of our past uh, that I'll give you. But I want to be clear again and reiterate to you as we move through this is that our first priority is to teach architecture. You know, but we operated a, we operate in a place in West Alabama that can benefit from critical thought from the critical thought of our students. Um, so we try to make our goal is to make appropriate affordable places for conversations to happen, and it mutually benefits the community. Is our goal. Um, I this is when I give this lecture. I'm not sure that Andrew, our director, would include this little bit, but I think it's really important to um, think about the the way that we teach our students is also learning from our mistakes, which I think is the best way to teach students. I'm not calling the Glass Chapel a mistake by any means. It's one of our most beautiful projects. It was experimental in that the the car windshields um, were used to uh, sheathe the outside of this, uh, you know, really remarkable space. But I think that the the lesson here is that um, the community there wasn't an organization in place in Mason's Bend, which is where this project was built, to maintain this pretty unique structure. And when you give a community a, a unique building and there isn't a way of understanding how to maintain it or an organization of people to do it. Sometimes it's not cared for in the way that you think it should be. And I'm no one's really at fault here because the rural studio now, and this is what it, its current condition, it's not the fault of the community for not knowing how to maintain a building with car windshields, because I don't know if any one of us here would really know how to do that. Rammed earth building at that. But the the important part, pedagogical part of this is that we now build um we build projects for organizations like the Perry Lakes Park here who that that exist and who have a um a strong sense of um that we didn't we didn't invent for them I guess so um the next project this is the Perry Lakes Park it's a it's a four year we have two major park projects in our in our um lineup and the first one that we did was this four year project out in Perry County, which is a neighboring project. It's an old WPA um, pro, uh, park that had fallen into disrepair, and the county received quite a bit of money to uh, revitalize the park and asked the rural studio to partner with them to um, create some of the facilities. So the first uh, piece that we built was the pavilion, which you can see the students, four students built. Um, this is you might recognize this also it's from about 2002 this project is pretty remarkable because it's built next to the Cahaba River and it's in a floodplain so the um, the platform is elevated the wood is all milled by the students themselves it's cedar which is you know a, a wood that's resistant to bugs and to rot for some amount of time I think that my favorite part of this project are the footings um, you can see that you, they knew they needed concrete, but instead of being, um, but they almost look like petrified tree stumps, the way that they lined the formwork with the slab from the, the bark from the, um, from the trees that they milled. The second part of this park revitalization was, of course, if you invite people to come and have a picnic, they need to have a place to use the restroom. So we like to think of these as the three most amazing pooping experiences uh, you'll ever have. So this is what we call the tall toilet. When you're sitting on the toilet, this is your view. This is the long toilet. So this is your view sitting out. And then the mound toilet. So you're actually looking down the septic mound into the fire lane when you're sitting in this bathroom. So four students built this as well. So I'm gonna keep saying that because I always think it's remarkable that four 24 year olds built you know, most of these projects. In a third part of this project is um, a covered bridge. We needed, we knew that we wanted to build a birding tower. So birding is an important part of this park. And we knew that we were gonna build a birding tower, but we, we needed a way to get to the tower first. So this bridge is a three-part truss that was built off-site with two 
um, pretty major uh, counterweights on each bank. And the components, the three components that were prefabricated were craned into place and attached to the counterweights. And then the center piece was plugged in. And um, this is actually one of my favorite projects because it's, um, it's almost, you know, it was completed in 2004 and it really hasn't aged. It might be because they used old barn metal. So it was already, it already looked old when it was new. But um, it, this is a pretty remarkable project for four students to build. The walkway now has a handrail, not in this picture, but um, the walkway is hung or suspended from the truss, which is overhead and makes the roof. And then the fourth component of uh, this project is the, uh, the birding tower. So we knew, like I said, the, we knew, the studio knew that they wanted to build a tower, but how to build a tower was pretty challenging, like for it to be high enough. So someone had the idea of buying um, a decommissioned fire tower from the state. So we bought this fire tower for $1, and these four students went to Texas, were trained to climb fire, fire towers, and disassembled it from its original location, regalvanized it, um, fixed any pieces that were bent, and then reconstructed it in its now in its home out by the, the oxbow lakes and this park is open to the public all the time and so anyone can climb up this uh, 100 foot tall tower and check out birds at all different uh, levels in the the tree canopy uh, a boardwalk was also necessary so that we call this the zigzag boardwalk and this takes you from the covered bridge to the to the tower and a pretty amazing asset really to this particular community and you can see that this an oxbow lake is um it's almost like a swamp in a way and it has uh, cypress trees it's really beautiful the only man-made uh structure besides the tower that you can see when you're on this uh, tower is just one silo off in the distance so it's a pretty remote part of our part of the um, area We've been working, uh, and we're, in, we're moving into our 27th year at Rural Studio, and it took about 15 years uh, for uh, the, the town, for us to be able to build a structure in our small town of New Bern. And the first thing that we built was a fire station. So the town of New Bern applied for a grant and uh, received funding to purchase a new fire truck, but they didn't have a place to put it. And instead of building a little metal building kind of off to the side, like sometimes volunteer fire departments do, we offered to um, we offered to build them a new meeting space and a uh, fire station. So four students built this. As you can see, one of the themes at Rural Studio is our use of wood, and I think you know it's a renewable. It's also a local resource, and we're pretty we're able to build pretty big things with just little sticks. And so that's another pet. It's one of it's one of the other things that we look at at Rural Studio. So these trusses were made by the students underneath the fabrication pavilion on our campus and then craned into place. This project did take the students about two and a half years. So they were here for a year and a half longer than graduation, but that speaks to the dedication um, that our students have for their work and for our place. There was a, there's a mezzanine that you can see up top and that was intended to be a meeting space for the town, but turned out that the fire station's not quite warm enough in the winter or cool enough in the summer for people to be in there. Um, so the next part of our project was a town hall. So some years later, uh, an opening was made from the side of the, the uh, fire station and we built our first mass timber building, which is made out of eight by eight cedar logs. And it is our, our town hall. Um, so, this isn't. This was like I said. We just completed a mass timber pod, but our first one was this um, project, and it's exactly what it is. It's just eight by eight um, uh, these logs stacked on top of one another, and there is a gasket in between them. But this is one of my favorite. This is another one of my favorite projects as well. The wood is protected by this big parasol of a roof. And then there's this lovely courtyard between the fire station and the town hall with a barbecue pit where um, community events can take place. This building is 
uh, oriented, its broadside is to the south, and it's amazing how well the the, uh, the cypress logs regulate temperature in the winter and in the summer with proper solar orientation. The third component of our of the town that we've you know of Newburn is a, a new library. So this is a an old bank. Once Newburn had over you know 15 or 20 buildings, and it was a bustling um, it's a bustling railroad stop uh, years ago. And this was the bank that was in Newburn, and it was sat uh, abandoned for many years. But there was a a group of local community members who wanted to start and build a uh, community, like a, a, a library, and that's exactly what we did. So we have a library board that was in place before we built the library, and now that's who supports this particular endeavor. So that's really important to us to make sure that the project continue with the strength of the, the board members and the community members behind them. Again, four students built this project. They did all of the mill work. And all of the books inside the library have been donated to us. Um, so no no books have ever been purchased, but they get they receive boxes and boxes of books from all over the country, and they sort through them and catalog them, and then have book sales for ones that maybe don't go on the shelves. So um, a pretty amazing operation. And you can see it's a pretty classic architecture student um, diagram or party. There's a thickened utility wall where this reading nook is and where the restrooms are and where the storage is. And then you have this open space where the, um, where the main library is. But it's, it's an actively used um, facility. It's open weekly. And, and volunteers that work there, and they're also paid employees. It's the only place in, in Newburn that has free uh, access to high-speed internet. And um, so they encourage community members. They have chairs out here now. They encourage people to sit in the courtyard and, and use the Wi-Fi. So no problem there. Um, but a really great asset to our community. So uh, I don't normally show this project in our lectures, but I'm going to show it today because there's a former student of, this is my thesis project when I was a student at the Rural Studio. So, and, and I'm sharing it today because a former student of mine from, I used to teach at Mississippi State, his name is Zach Henry, he's also from Knoxville, but now he teaches, I um, mean, um, excuse me, he works at Duval Decker in Jackson, Mississippi, so I know he's listening, so I thought he might, if I haven't shown him my thesis project, he might like to see it. But this is the, I was a second year architecture student at the Rural Studio, I was a fifth year student, I stayed as an instructor, and now I'm back as an associate professor, so. You could call me goal-oriented or you could call me a little nuts. Um, we call that snake bit at the Rural Studio. But my project is in uh, Marengo County. And our job was to help this organization called the Alabama Rural Heritage Foundation build a gift shop. And their mission is to preserve the rural arts in West Alabama. So they sell uh, arts and crafts and all sorts of things that are made by local artisans on consignment. And this was their building. It's the old home economic building of the um, now abandoned Marengo County High School. And, you know, the we were struck, my classmates and I were struck by the, you know, this is a pretty beautiful space. It wasn't very well utilized. You can see it's mainly just storage, but this is the space that the the boys in high school used to learn to weld and do shop class and those kinds of things. Um, and we start out like most other, we, you know, with crazy ideas. So this is some sketch, these are some sketches that I made. Uh, one of the other thing that they do is they sell pepper jelly, which you know is um, uh, bell peppers and jalapenos and you eat it over cream cheese. So they make pepper jelly and sell it there. Um, and so our solution to this project was to build this kind of, jewel box um, gift shop inside the old home economics building. So, you know, from sketches to concepts, you know, to make the proposals, really what the most important part is just getting down to, to doing the work. And sometimes you have to fix what you break. 
Uh, so what I enjoy like kind of philosophically or conceptually about this project is the room, we, we knocked this with the help of an engineer, we knocked this hole between the large shop space and the, the room where the women learn to sew. So we kind of, we, not, we took away those boundaries from this particular building and we inserted these hoops that were fabricated by a local fabricator and, um, and provided a place to display the wares that they're selling and also uh, a place to sell pepper jelly. So that's what the pepper jelly wall is the first thing that you're faced with when you walk up this ramp and either choose go, to go left or right um, into the building. So this, uh, if you know Marlon Blackwell's work, uh, it looks a little bit like his honey house. And I always joke that he stole um, that idea from us, but, but not really. So, so here's that same space. And you know the 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 big shop space was still an important place. You know we envisioned it being used as a gallery, so some of the bigger artwork or uh, would be sold and displayed in this space. And it is. But um, going back to learning from our lessons, I love this image because well, first of all, it shows that this project is is being used, which is really important. But it also shows, and I talked to my students about this, is that that cantilever that we worked so hard to achieve, you can see it looks like this glass box is hovering over the floor. That cantilever was not important to, not as important to the client as it was to four architecture students. The stage was more important. And, um, and I really appreciate that. I really like to see when our buildings become owned and occupied by the people that use them and um, that maybe don't care about a cantilever as much as we did. So talking about students, in the last little bit of, the, of my presentation, I want to talk to you about what my third year students have been up to um, in looking at housing affordability. So uh, the Rural Studio has moved um, a long way from the Haybell House, which is what I showed you in the first part of the presentation. And we've started looking at how to make an affordable, replicable model, house model that can be repeated not only in our area, but can be used by other housing nonprofits, a floor plan that can be built and used by other housing nonprofits like Habitat for Humanity or, um, uh, or, other, or, or other groups. So each year, my students take one of the, there's three house models that they pick from and um, they, they all look, they're all about 600 square feet. We, they're one bedroom homes. We take one of those and we modify it for a client. And the third year students build the house. Um, so my students look a lot like this. They're about, nine, sometimes they're 20, sometimes they're 21 years old. Sometimes I get a few older ones and they can accomplish incredible things. We start the semester with what I call a sawhorse race. So I uh, give them a pile of materials and I ask them in teams to design a set of sawhorses that must stand up to a series of performance tests because what I want them to understand is that we're always going to be analyzing the performance of the things that we design. So, uh, and then of course the sawhorses, the first set that they build usually don't work very well and then we rebuild them and then we use them for the rest of the year on the job site. And then these are the these are diagrams of the three houses that we pick from for our clients. Um, we we call these max there they have they, our houses are always named after the first client that we build them for. So the one on the left is Max house and then it's Joanne's house and then it's Dave's house. And you know, the fifth year students also study housing affordability and they make new house models. They make new prototypes. We have over 25 of them and they look at pretty broad issues like um, maybe aging in place or or sheltering in place. But my students, we get really deep on a few issues and we learn about our client to kind of, for lack of a better term, tweak these prototypes to make them more usable for more people, if that makes sense. So at the beginning of the semester, um, my students meet a client, meet our client, and the house is always a gift to someone in our community. Um, 
um, the requirements for receiving, the, you know, for getting this house is really not very stringent. Uh, I just need someone who can have a one bedroom house and owns their own property and can deal with us for nine months, you know, in their business. So our students, I have them do ex like this. These are like color coded framing models. So they understand the building before they are allowed to manipulate it and then to build it. And then we do all sorts of uh, diagram studies. We study how they're put together, but when we make a change, because that's what third year does, we make, um, we suggest new alternative. We suggest alternatives for like, let's say foundation types. So this is taking these three houses that were originally built on piers. And what does it, what do they look like if they're built on a slab on grade? How does it change the architecture? We study their characteristics and their assets, like, you know, for this site and for this client, which porch is most appropriate. We look at things like, um, you know, for instance, how much area is on each house in terms of, uh, you know, efficiency. We draw big things in third year. So these are full scale building sections that I, drew, we ha I had the students draw to understand the magnitude and the scale at which they were, you know, we were about to build a house and we pinned them up on the side of the, of the fire station. Um, a drawing full scale is, a, is important at the rural studio. These are, um, these are assessments of existing buildings where the students have to kind of figure out how the buildings are put together. But you really, these are all preparations for building in real life. In third year, we also, like I said, we get we get very deep on the technical level, learning to put buildings together and drawing big drawings. But we also really um, want to understand our client, and I have them do that in uh, numerous ways. The traditional way is a, a a a client interview, and we do that. But I find that in the dynamic of someone receiving a house. And then talking to them, it's not, uh, we don't, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult dynamic. And it's actually easier to learn about the client through the house that they, they currently live in. So this is my client Ree's house. This is her house trailer before we built her a new house. And one of the methods that I've been uh, developing over the last few years to teach students about their client is to draw uh, very carefully on very precious paper, so a sheet of arches do orthographic elevations and graphite renderings and to really understand the client. So you can see that that's the photograph and there's there's more stuff in this elevation than this rendering is showing. And that's because what I've asked the student to do is edit what uh, he or she thinks to be important to uh, Ree's way of life or patterns of life. So um, the wind chimes are highlighted in this particular rendering. And you can see that the truck is also here. And it might be confusing that why would a pickup truck be part of a, a client study? But that's because to Re, her truck is really important. She has a license plate that says my yo. She also has um, bad knees. So she has some mobility impairment and she needs to park very close to her house so she doesn't have far to walk. So these observations, although they might seem minor, are really important to um, our client's way of life. And I also think that it's really important for architecture students to still be able to hand draw an orthographic elevation. And not only that, uh, these are one point perspectives. Uh, I think the intention of these drawings is that I have the students each year to catalog each belonging of our client. And because it's really important to, for us to understand what our client will be taking over um, to the new house, because often their old house is uh, bigger than their new house. So we talk to the clients about what will be coming over, and that helps us decide which of the three houses is most appropriate for that particular client. But, you know, the, the pedagogical or the architecture school lesson is that I think it's really important for students to be able to take field measurements and do as-is drawings. So that's an added benefit of these um, of, for these exercises. These are my current client is a lady named Ophelia, and this is the the site plan and the the house plan of her existing home. So we really understand existing conditions very intensely before we ever make a decision about what 
uh, a new uh, house would go. I have them, you know, these are CAD drawings this time, but I ask them to draw each crooked thing. Don't draw it perfectly, don't straighten it up because we can learn from what's crooked. Usually if it's crooked, it means um, something's broken and we don't wanna repeat that mistake. We start on the same page, we do charrettes together. We are constantly changing up groups so no one becomes too, um, too dedicated or too uh, territorial over one idea. We present to the client, we get feedback, we present to outside experts, we do technical drawings, um, we do scheduling activities. This is the way I keep students um, scheduled as we do pull planning sessions. Then, you know, in the end, the, the best thing that we do is that we learn uh, how to put buildings together. And, you know, I think another important lesson here is that each one of these students had to try to lay this block wall and now they realize how difficult this task is. And I hope that they'll have more respect for a block mason in their future. This is Ree's elevated slab. We frame the house, we build the house, and then we finish it. And this is the interior. This is Re. So, you know, this is the, the lady, the renderings that I just showed you of the, the front porch. So this is how those renderings helped to change that particular prototype because our, our challenge is to modify a prototype to fit a particular client's need. So the parking pad of the original pickup truck is actually exactly in the same location. Her front porch is exactly in the same location because she told us that uh, she sits on her front porch until the sun hits her toes in the afternoon. So the view from her new front porch is the same as her old front porch. And her sister lives next door. So we um, designed a set of stairs that would more easily connect the two sisters. And we incorporated a ramp from the parking pad under the overhang for Ree to be able to access her house. Um, I'm coming to a close. Uh, I can see that I'm at 11.41, so I'm doing pretty well. Uh, I think, you know, one of the other parts of the Rural Studio that I want to, you know, circle back around to is the aspect of community, not only in our West Alabama home and helping our neighbors with housing and spaces for, for community events and for community conversations, but we're also, you know, we've been moving into looking at the infrastructural issues of the rural of, of rural places. And the first one that we are trying to tackle is access to fresh food. So this greenhouse that the students are working in was a, was a student project. It was a multi-year student project. And now uh, we have a full-time farm manager who grows our food. We eat meals together. It's been modified because of COVID, but um, we have a full-time cook, lunch and dinner fed to the students. And the students all take turns working in the farm. So they have shifts from six to eight in the morning to help grow the food. Um, and I, you know, I think that that's kind of a, a nice ending to think about how important community is and how important it is to um, learn about, well, buildings by putting them together, but also, you know, for instance, food by putting, uh, growing your food and where does that come from? There's lots of lessons about uh, the the rural that we're um, that we're interested in, and those you know I think that that's why we've been so successful. I think in our in, in our neck of the woods is learning from what's there. Of course, we have a, a few books, so you should check them out. And we also have at the end of each year a big pig roast celebration. I'm sure it will be a little bit different this year, but when things go back to our new normal. We would love for any of you to come and visit us um, in May, our early May and April, to come to our graduation to see what projects are happening. And um, yeah, I, I was really pleased to be able to speak to you guys today. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Emily. That was really inspiring. That was awesome. Um, just a reminder for everybody to please, anyone who has a question, please go ahead and um, enter it in. And I've got a few of my own that I think would be nice to engage with. So um, a question, you're so the program is so integrated with what's happening on a community level. 
How does that process work? Um, are you guys kind of evaluating and saying this is the stock of homes or this is the stock of community spaces that we anticipate that this area might need over the next five or 10 years? Or is the community coming to you and saying, hey, we're really interested in this. Can you help us find a way? Yes, the good question. I th it, that's evolved. I mean, I think that the point of me showing like the the, the glass chapel, which is a beautiful project, but that was an example of us suggesting that that particular community needs, a, you need a community center, you know, when in fact, maybe they didn't need a community center because maybe their church was their community center and they didn't need us to build a new one. Um, so we rely now on organizations that are in, um, that exist. So I didn't show a picture of it, but the Lions Park, is an organization that was, you know, with boys and girls clubs. So we are we are seeking groups of people who are working in the community and that would benefit from a new space, right? And that we can help them envision that. So that's main that's mainly how we work these days. And and now that we've been here for 27 years, we often have people come in to approach us. So um, that, that that's the way we work. And same thing with housing. You know, well, m m I rely, to find my clients, I rely on our postmaster and our mayor of New Bern, who's also the volunteer mm -hmm. fire department chief. And they know the community and the people in the community better than I do. And I ask them for recommendations for who might, um, whose family might benefit from a, from a new home. And we do kind of short interviews, and um, that's that's pretty much it. But we rely on our community to direct us to the, the projects that we make. It's really it's really interesting. Um, it's neat that that relationship has been maintained for so many years. That's um, pretty impactful. Um, so financial support for the program, how is that generated and maintained? Sure. Um, Lots of people want to know that question, and the answer is that we operate off of gifts and grants. Uh, of course, overhead is paid by Auburn University, so my salary is paid. Like I'm just a I'm a faculty member, and and um, so our overhead is covered. the The teaching overhead is covered by the university, but everything else is um, operates off of lots of small gifts actually, and grants and relationships with granting agencies that we've had for many years. And we have a full-time grant writer who works with our foundation to help bring um, money in each year. And just so you know, um, I get about $40,000 each year to build a house. And I try to aim for spending less than that. But that's my budget to build a house, even though they're called 20K House. That's kind of another lecture, the 20K House lecture. But um, they do cost more than $20,000. And I get about $40,000 to do it. So. How much is a typical habitat house? Do you know? Um, I don't know. I mean, we the Front Porch Initiative, which is our research and development group for the housing affordability study, we uh, we suggest that one of our small buildings out in the world um, would cost between sixty and seventy thousand dollars. And actually, you know, again, it's another lecture, but it's kind of fun to know the Front Porch Initiative is building, we have test build partners right now. And actually there's four houses in Nashville that are being built by an organization that are some of our prototypes. And so we're testing that out right now. We, you know, until we have a few under our belt and built, and we won't really fully know, and it will change per region, but um, we're building them in the world right now to get more information about what their the real cost is. That's excellent. Okay, question um, from Mr. Gene Burr. Any chance that you have tracked former students to know what they are doing today after five or 10 years beyond Roll Studio? That's such a, um, that question, I've been asked that several times just in the past year. And I get, we don't, we don't, I mean, we track, we know where our students are, but there hasn't been like a formal study to, or a formal kind of analysis to see how an education like this might affect the trajectory of uh, an architecture student. Um, I do, you know, many of them join practices and become directors of just like most architecture students. 
we have a few that have their own um, their own practices and many of them actually the the building bug never leaves them and they have fabrication companies in and around the area like metal fabrication companies there's a few teachers like me um, but I think that the our hope is that in whatever work the students are doing um, that their sense of being what we call a citizen architect never leaves them and um, the understanding the importance of designers in um, you know understanding that good design is for everyone that's kind of our philosophy follows them throughout their their entire career no matter what it is excellent okay question from um aaron jennigan thanks emily that was excellent i'm curious as to how role studio acquires funding which we've already talked about how the students um how are the students involved in this process how are target budgets budgets established and do students control estimates in the design build process yeah yes so um the projects like through grants and um gifts are not fully they that doesn't fully fund a particular project so there is a kind of a pot of money that I, let's just talk about community projects and not um not the housing projects because those are different but in a community project students might be given an initial budget that comes from the the big you know pot of money from a rural studio and they are they do actively estimate materials and costs of things of course labor they're the labor so they're not estimating labor costs but they do materials costs and they put together budgets i think the most the biggest contribution that the students make are seeking um, donations so in a project that I didn't show you today, it's a community center for a town named Fonsdale. Those students raised or um, over $70,000 worth of um, material donations. So they work very hard. They don't earn dollars, but they work very hard to gather materials to put the buildings together with. So they do contribute to that and they do their own schedules and budget as well. Such excellent experience for, I mean, I feel like the the students that are involved in this program are just such a step ahead when they do star in a traditional, um, traditional role. Uh, okay, last question from the audience here. Rural Studio has expanded from New Bern to other communities. How do you determine where to expand? Well, there, there's one answer is that we don't, we do we try to keep everything in a 25 mile radius. That's our goal because we don't want our students to have to drive too far. So that's the first thing. Um, and then really what we're looking for is just good community partners, you know, so within that 25 mile radius, uh, who has an idea? Is there an organization that could benefit from space, you know, designed by the students? So actually, um, if you look at the map of Alabama, I I think next fall in 2021, we will be doing several projects in our neighboring town of Marion, which was near the Perry Lakes Park that I showed you. And um, I think one will be uh, a museum or as a visitor center for the Lincoln School, which was a slave built church and school uh, in that community. So that will be a really interesting project. And there's also a community arts center online in, um, in New Bern. We, we did work, I mean, in Marion, Last year, we did have a project in uh, Moundville, which is a little bit further, but it was worth the with the University of Alabama and the Moundville State Park, which is Indian Mounds. So we it, we really look for good partnerships, and that can draw us out of our 25 mile radius sometimes. So, awesome. thank you so much for joining us today. This has been really oh, excellent. I enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. And you're welcome to come to Knoxville anytime. We'd love to see you in person once we get past um, past COVID. So thank you. I appreciate that. And all of you guys are welcome. We're still we still have visitors even during COVID. You got to wear your mask, but you can't go inside some places. But you're still it's one of those places that um, even during the pandemic where we're doing a, we're hopefully doing OK. You can come visit. So tell us what the process looks like, because I know some of these spaces are private. If we wanted to go down and do a road trip. Sure. If you want to do a road trip, the I mean, you can always email our, Natalie um, is our communications um, ex, 
uh, communications administrator. So you can uh, email her and, but the answer to that is really that our main um, campus building, which we call the Morissette House, you can show up there. We have a bell on the front porch and Heather who works in the office will come out and bring you a map. And it tells you which projects you'd be able to kind of to go to during when we're not during the when, when we're not in the pandemic we offer some tours on saturdays but we haven't been doing that for a while but yeah you can basically just show up during the office hours and get a map and then tour around and um the houses aren't really on the we don't have the houses on the tour anymore but there are a lot of community buildings that you're able to see and to check out yes and you guys if anybody's really interested in coming you can email me and i can help you too Awesome. Thank you, Emily. We appreciate you so much. Thank Take you, care. guys. Thanks, everybody. Happy holidays. Have a great Bye -bye. new year. Bye.